Welcome to a new series called the United States of Geology. In this series, we will explore every state in the U.S. to try and develop an appreciation for and learn a little something about every state's geology. We also try and explore job opportunities in each state, seeing as there's an, a mass exodus in certain states fleeing toward other states. What better state to start with than the supposed flattest and most boring state in the Union, the sunflower state, Kansas. Kansas is actually seeing a surge in people as people flee terrible policies in other states. One of those places growing is Overland Park, a suburb of Kansas City. Does every geology student in the state have to travel west to Colorado for their field camp? What possible geology jobs can you get in Kansas? Do Kansas geology students have to flee Kansas once they graduate like they're escaping an area in the path of an F5 tornado? First, let's start off with the topography of Kansas. Is Kansas the flattest state in the country? No, technically it's Florida. However, Kansas has garnered the reputation of being a flyover state that is only known for farmlands and tornadoes and the Jayhawks and the Wildcats because it is flat. Kansas is approximately 400 miles east to west and 205 miles north to south, covering approximately 82,000 square miles. Google Earth will show you that from east to west, you have an elevation change of approximately 3,104 feet. North to south, approximately 656 feet of elevation, trekking through multiple streams and rivers. The highest point in Kansas is Mount Sunflower, approximate to the Colorado border to the west. The lowest point, the Verdigris River in southern Kansas. General trend of rivers in the state is east to west, but in the eastern part of the state, you do have rivers that go against this trend and head towards the Kansas-Oklahoma border. The longest river in Kansas is the Saline River in northern Kansas, close to the Nebraska border. The high plains dominate the western portion of the state with the Arkansas River lowlands cross-cutting through the southern portion of the state. Red Hills, Wellington, McPherson lowlands, Flint Hills uplands, Chautauqua Hills, Cherokee Lowlands, the Ozark Plateau, and the Osage Cuestas fill up the rest of the southern and central portions of Kansas. Along the northern border of the state, you get into the furthest extent of glaciation in the state of Kansas and the Smoky Hills. There are eight total aquifers in Kansas, the largest being the Dakota Confined Unconfined Aquifer, or also known as the High Plains Aquifer. The Dakota Aquifer System extends across much of the central North American continent from approximately the Arctic Circle in Canada to northeastern New Mexico, and the Oklahoma Panhandle from the Rocky Mountains to western Iowa and Minnesota. The aquifer underlies approximately 40,000 square miles of the western two-thirds of Kansas. The Ogala Aquifer, one of the largest aquifers in the country and an important water source for farmers across the Great Plains, is included within the High Plains Aquifer System. Wells drilled in the High Plains Aquifer provide more water for cities, industry, and agriculture than wells in Kansas's other aquifers combined. The Kansas portion of the Dakota Aquifer System consists of sandstone bodies encapsulated in shells. Not all these geological formations are present throughout the aquifer's extent. The combined thickness of these geologic units range up to more than 700 feet in parts of west central Kansas. Groundwater flow trends in the confined area of the Dakota generally from southwest to northeast while recharge areas tend to be in the unconfined portion. Now let's run through the geologic history of Kansas. Generally, the formations exposed at the surface are younger in the western part of the state. The oldest rocks will be exposed in the eastern part of the state. This would be called a younging direction east to west, which would correlate with the general trend of the rivers and streams and the significant elevation changes as we spoke about earlier. Let's start from the beginning though. Throughout the, much of the Precambrian, the continents were forming, and it would have been a pretty nasty time for anything living, hot, gassy, low oxygen. Because Kansas is a part of the North American Craton, the core of the continent's crust, the crust formed during this time in some of the first and oldest rock in North America. Granodiorite, shale, sandstones, and some limestones were originally deposited during this time between 4.6 billion years and 542 million years ago. These are protolith rocks to what is now observed as quartzite, marble, granulite, schist, phyllite, and gneiss, intruded by granite, gabbro, and cyanite, which is cumulatively called the basement complex. Of course, these rocks can only be observed in deep core analyses. The granodiorite makes sense as volcanism was dominant during the Hadean and Archaean. However, oceans started truly forming during the early Proterozoic and with this microbial life during the late Proterozoic 
The earliest known Epiarch Sea and Cratonic sequence, the Sauk sequence, covered portions of the North American continent. This is evidenced by the deposition of sandstone shales and limestones. Sandstones typically form in oceanic environments near shore and high energy, and the sediments were probably derived from the granodiorite making up the crust at the time. Whereas shales will form further out from the near shore in deeper, lower in energy environments on the continental shelf. Limestone will typically form in shallow, warmer climate environments, either in the near shore or along the edge of the continental shelf, which means there was not only oceans, but there is also climate shifts and or tectonic activity. Limestones can also form in cold water environments. They are typically uh, limited to the edge of the continental shelf in, in that regard, but limestones can form in colder environments. Although worldwide glaciation, also called snowball earth, probably played a significant role in this shift in climate, tectonic activity was extremely active during many separate orogenies throughout the Precambrian. The Algoman, the Wapme, the Trans-Hudson, the Cotildian, the Pinocchian, Great Falls, Mazatzal, and Picurus. However, the orogenies that most likely had the most impact on Kansas were the Central Plains and Grenville orogenies. The Central Plains orogeny is believed to have occurred 1.7 billion years ago. The Grenville occurred during the formation of the supercontinent Rodinia, which helped form the related mid-continent rift that cuts through central Kansas. The MCR is a positive gravity anomaly, which basically means more gravity was measured than expected due to something like higher densities and or thicker crust related to axial basins filled with basalt and immature plastic rocks that display evidence of crustal extension or rifting. This rift system cut through several Precambrian basement terrains in the Craton that existed prior to 1.2 billion years ago. Some 50 miles to the west, the southernmost extension of the Proterozoic Mid-Continent Rift system extends into northeast Kansas. The compressional forces during the Central Plain orogeny probably aided in the metamorphism of protolith rocks in Kansas. Compressional forces from the Granville orogeny probably helped trigger the rifting of the crust, which almost broke the United States into two different continents. A large unconformity separates these Precambrian rocks from the next rocks in the section deposited during the Cambrian Ordovician boundary. This is probably related to the large scale glaciation, also known as Snowball Earth, which covered almost the entire planet in ice approximately 1 billion years ago. This Snowball Earth event is theorized to be the culprit for the Great Unconformity, an event that caused either erosion or a lack of deposition for 600 million years or up to as much as 1.6 billion years of missing geologic time. The Canberra Ordovician rocks consist of dolomite mainly, but also includes limestone, sandstone, and shell. So at this point, it was definitely a tropical environment. The Sauk sequence regression began in the early Ordovician, which matches up with the ages of these marine carbonate sedimentary rocks that formed in a shallow tropical sea, limestone and dolostone. The sandstone and shells represent yet another shift in climate. The regression of the Sauk Sea brings on another unconformity until the Tippecanoe sequence begins its transgression onto the North American continent in the Middle Ordovician. The Caledonian orogeny caused by the collision of Laurentia, Baltica, and Avalonia included multiple phases of orogeny. So the late Precambrian into the Devonian Kansas displays Evidence of being affected by this major orogeny in the early Paleozoic, including structures such as the ancestral Central Kansas Uplift, the Chautauqua Arch, the North Kansas Basin, and Hugaton Embayment. Silurian and Devonian rocks lie above the Cambro Ordovician rocks and are predominantly limestone and dolomite, defining a tropical environment at the time. The regression of the Tippecanoe sequence occurs in the early Devonian, creating another unconformity between the Devonian rocks and the overlying Mississippian rocks, or early car Carboniferous to the rest of the world. Transgression of the Kaskaskia sequence began in the mid-Devonian. The Caledonian orogeny ceased at the end of the Devonian, leaving marks in the form of the structures like the Dodge City Basin, Ozark, Homocline, Southwest, Kansas Basin. The Mississippian rocks in, in Kansas consist mostly of limestones, but also include shells. The deposition of limestones and shells basically signifies the edge of a continental shelf. So Kansas at this point was in the ocean, but you had deposition of limestones and shells. 
Quartz sandstones are also found of this age east of Kansas, which eroded from the Appalachian orog orogenic belt. The Kaskaskia sequence regressed in the mid-Mississippian. The Absaroka sequence followed at the end of the Mississippian. The unconformity created by this unconformity between the Kaskaskia and Absaroka is what divides the Carboniferous into the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian in North America. Following the Mississippian, the structures of Kansas displayed evidence of yet more orogenies that affected the state, called the Appalachian and Watita orogenies throughout the late Paleozoic. These orogenies, specifically the Alleghenian, Orogeny that evidences the formation of the supercontinent Pangaea would leave behind evidence in the form of structures such as the Bourbon Arch, Cambridge Arch, Central Kansas Uplift, or also called the Barton Arch or Russell Arch, the Cherokee Basin, Nemaha Uplift, and the Sedwick Basin. Specifically, the Nemaha Uplift is a deep fault zone that formed during the late Precambrian orogenies, which runs diagonally across East Kansas and extends from just south of Omaha, Nebraska to Oklahoma City. This fault zone directly overlies a granite high in the Precambrian basement and is structurally active as the Humboldt Fault. It is the most famous structure in Kansas and has been explored for oil. Structurally, it contains multiple high angle normal and reverse faults. Like the Mississippian, the Pennsylvanian rocks are dominantly limestones and shales. One difference is that cyclothems occurred in the Pennsylvanian, alternating marine and non-marine strata indicate constant changes in sea level, most likely tied to glaciation that was occurring on Earth at the time. Much like Pennsylvanian rocks, the Permian rocks also contain dominantly alternating beds of limestones and shells, probably due to cyclothems during the Absaroka sequence. The Absaroka regressed in the Permian period and at the end of the Permian, the greatest extinction event in Earth's history occurred. A major unconformity occurs between the Permian and Jurassic rocks, where the Triassic is completely missing from the geologic timescale in Kansas. Jurassic rocks include dominantly shale with limestone, sandstone, and small amounts of chert and anhydrite, which is an evaporite mineral. Another epiaric transgression occurs called the Zuni sequence. This begins in the late Jurassic and peaks in the late Cretaceous, forming what is known as the Western Interior Seaway or Cretaceous Interior Seaway. This will be the final major epiaric seed to affect Kansas. Cretaceous rocks in Kansas consist of mostly marine sedimentary rocks. This includes shale, sandstone, limestone, chalk, along with non-marine sandstone and clay with minor amounts of lignitic coal, bentonite, chert, and anhydrite. Regression of this sea occurs at the beginning of the Paleocene during the Cenozoic era. Additionally, during the late Cretaceous, another orogeny impacts Kansas, known as the Laramide orogeny, which thrusts the Rocky Mountains up into existence. This is evidenced by the Western Kansas Basin, which is a result of tilting beds to the Northwest. A major unconformity is found after Cretaceous rocks, separating them from the above Neogene rocks, approximately 22 million years of missing geologic time. The Neogene rocks include the Ogala formation mentioned earlier as the Rocky Mountains were being uplifted into existence. Plastic sediments were being eroded eastward via alluvial streams and deposition. The upper member of the Ogala, named Caprock, contains calcrete beds, which defines the high plain surface. Caprock is referred to as caliche or algal limestone. Beneath the Caprock is unconsolidated sand and gravel cemented with calcites and silicas. Quaternary deposits as old as 2.6 million years contain loess and river valley deposits, sand dunes, and glacial drift deposits. When the last glaciation to occur on Earth began approximately 110,000 years ago, glacial maximum at 20,000 years ago, and ending approximately 12,500 years ago. You can see the glacial limit toward the northeast border. Since the end of this glaciation, the glaciers that once existed in Kansas have since receded. There are 28 state parks in Kansas scattered throughout the state, the most popular being El Dorado State Park, northeast of Wichita get you some good fishing in. One of the 10 national parks in Kansas, Prairie National Park west southwest of Kansas City is a preserve of the tall grass prairie. This prairie once covered 140 million acres and has dwindled down to 5.6 million acres, most likely affected by agriculture. In November 1996, an approximate area of 11,000 acres was legislated into a national park to help preserve these tall grasslands. Probably the most important national park in Kansas is the National Historic Site where Brown v. Board of Education was decided, which ended legal segregation in public schools. You also have the California National Historic Trails, 
Fort Larne National Historic Site, Fort Scott National Historic Site, Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail, which spans multiple states extending from Pennsylvania through to Oregon, Nicodemus National Historic Site, the infamous Oregon National Historical Trail that spans six states from Oregon to Missouri, the Pony Express National Historic Trail, and the Santa Fe Historic Trail. If you live in Kansas and are interested in studying geology in the state of Kansas, you could attend Kansas State, the University of Kansas, Wichita State, Emporia State, or Fort Hayes State. Kansas State is considered the best in the state, and based on my limited experience, they seem to be a great school for environmental geology purposes as they offer reviews or technical assistance of EPA brownfields applications. Kansas State is projected to be a top 50 public research university by 2025, and the school focuses on many different subsections of geology research, from climate to oil and gas to hydrogeology. You could pursue a bachelor's degree in geology, a dual bachelor's of science degree in geology and civil engineering. You could minor in geophysics or geology. You could get the certificate to teach, or you could get a natural resources and environmental sciences secondary major. They have a geology track, energy and natural resources track, and an environmental geosciences track. For a graduate degree, you could do the geology option in their diverse assortment of research opportunities. Based on the geology of Kansas and your, your goal of living in Kansas, the best field to go into would probably be the environmental field. It seems Kansas State is improving as an energy school, though. Kansas University, or the University of Kansas, is, is an R1 research institution. They offer undergraduate and graduate degrees in geology for bachelors of arts and bachelor of science. Research at KU can vary from glaciology to hydrogeology to tectonics. KU actually did their most recent field camp in Colorado and Utah. Wichita State offers undergraduate degrees in geology, both in bachelor of arts and bachelor of science, a certificate in environment and sustainability and a graduate degree in Earth, Environmental, and Physical Sciences. Wichita State just did its virtual field camp in the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming and Montana. As we have talked about, some minor oil drilling has occurred in Kansas, although they were only test wells to see how much they could recover. Not much. Kansas actually was a large provider of natural gas, though. Although the Hugoton field is dwindling significantly, do they mine in Kansas? Currently, no, except for salt mining. Historically, yes. Kansas was actually a world leader in the production of zinc and lead, which peaked and ended before the year of 1970. Coal mining was a thing at 1.2, but it peaked in 1918. So I guess thank you, thank you, Kansas, for the salt on my french fries. What about environmental issues in Kansas, which would fuel environmental consulting work? There will always be localized environmental issues like a leaking petroleum storage tank or an, or an oil spill that seeps into soil. What about bigger issues? Well, due to Kansas's agriculturally dominated economy, pesticide contamination is a major issue. These poor farmers have higher rates of cancer due to pesticides, but also exposure to petroleum products because they fill their own tanks. In Kansas, they also do minor mining cleanup in Hutchinson, where all the site mining goes on. As mentioned earlier, the Ogala Aquifer is a major source of groundwater for a large part of the country, mainly for agriculture. Groundwater levels have dwindled 40 to 50 percent over the years, and the EPA rates Kansas as a bottom tier state in terms of cleanliness of groundwater and other important natural resources such as soil and air. This would be due to contaminants such as pesticides, but also pathogens and inorganics and toxics. Runoff fertilizers into local and or regional streams, spills. Kansas has many kinks to work out and a lot of potential work for environmental consultants. The state of Kansas does have a professional geoscientist licensure board called the Kansas State Board of Technical Professions. You can take both your FG or Fundamentals of Geology and or PG Principles of Geology exams in Topeka, Kansas. The licensure is important in the environmental field and not as important if your goal is to go into mining or oil. How is the job outlook currently at the time this video is made for the state of Kansas for a geologist? According to Glassdoor, geotech and environmental scientist geologist positions will dominate most postings and you would be looking at Kansas City, Wichita, Overland Park, Topeka, Lenexa, and Manhattan as your destination. It seems geology jobs are far and few between 
and that your first job in Kansas would be either in the geotech or environmental sectors. Thanks for watching and I hope you learned something about Kansas and I hope this changed your mind that Kansas might actually be worth visiting. For any Kansas natives watching, did I miss anything? Let me know in the comments section. I will add it to the description and into the video if plausible. In the next episode of this series, we will be heading southwest toward the state of Nevada.